Welcome to the MemberWise Best Practice Series. This video is brought to you today by the MemberWise Network, the leading free-to-join best practice network for membership and association professionals. We hope that you enjoy this great presentation and for further information about our growing network, please visit www.memberwise.org.uk. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, thank you, Richard. Um, my name is Simon Waitman. I'm Director of Strategy and Marketing at Decent. And again, so next 20 minutes, half hour, really we're going to be delving into digital strategy, what it is, what it should be, what it shouldn't be, and also an opportunity for some questions as well. Uh, my background, um, I've worked across digital in a number of sectors, both public and private sectors. I've worked in interactive TV.com, I've worked in e-commerce retail. So I'm going to try and draw on some of that experience um, in the presentation today. So without further ado, I'm going to cover three parts to the presentation, really. First up, I'm going to talk about what is a digital strategy and do you actually need one? Second, I'm going to talk about what goes into a digital strategy. So we've probably all got different thoughts about what makes up a good digital strategy, and I'm going to share some of my experience with that. And then, last of all, I'm going to talk about getting it right, overcoming the common pitfalls. And when I was putting together my presentation today, I was kind of thinking about what today's like for you guys as people attending a conference. And I know what happens is everyone stands up and talks about all the things they've done, and they talk about all the best practice they've seen. So because I'm a little bit contrary like that, I'm going to do it a different way. I'm also going to share with you the confessions of a digital strategist, so the things that I've copped up over the years, the things that I've got wrong, and I've even, because we're a bit social, I've got a little hashtag. So you're welcome to use hash Simon fail, which we're going to pick up a few things that I am happy to confess publicly to um, during the presentation, and you can pillory about me about them later on. So, what's the digital strategy, and do you actually need one? And to start off with, we're going to go for Simon Fail number one. So the, this, is, this is something I said probably about four years ago when I was working, I did some work with the county council about a digital strategy. And at that stage, I was thinking, do we actually want to need a digital strategy? So a council, they've got lots of strategies. They've got more strategies than you could um, possibly imagine. Do we need another one that says digital on it? Because I was thinking digital, it's kind of pervasive. It goes through everything that they want to do as an organisation. So do we need a separate strategy that's about digital? And my effort at that time was thinking, no, actually, we want to put digital into the other strategy. So it's kind of a strand that runs through everything else. And I guess as a purist, that's probably still right. I still believe that's the right thing to do. But in practice, it just doesn't work like that. You can't just say digital is going to flow through everything and then every strategy that you've got for everything else has digital in it. So that was my first fail. And actually, what should a digital strategy be? I think a digital strategy really should be a focus for change. So it's an enabler. It makes, gives you the tools, the capacity, the capability to put digital into everything else. And that's why I think you need a digital strategy rather than trying to thread it through everything else. So there's my first confession. There's quite a lot of these, actually. I didn't realise until I got to the end of the presentation how many things I'd actually got wrong over the years. But, so if you write strategies, some of you may have strategies that look like that. They're as thick as a book. You spend months writing them. Then they go through the management approval process, which maybe goes to some committees. Then maybe they have to go to boards as well. So by the time you've written them, they're about that thick. They've been amended by just about everyone. Um, they bear a slight resemblance to what they were in the first place. And you're maybe six months, 12 months down the line, depending on how long it takes you to write your strategies. Does that work in practice? Does this work in practice? There we go. So what's, what, does a strategy, what do we mean by a strategy? And I think I picked out a definition from um, a business website just to work with here. So strategy is a means by which an organisation can achieve some objectives, which is kind of sensible. And strategies, business planning processes typically run a multi-year cycle, don't you? So most people probably write maybe a five-year vision and a two-year plan and a one-year plan, etc. But there's a flaw in this when it comes to digital, isn't there? And that is around the fact that a three to five year time scale. So in lots of things that happen that you do in your organisations, you may be able to see a three to five year time span. You may know some of the things that are happening in your world in a three to five year time span. But the digital world is very, very different. So if I take you back five years, this, this was five years ago that Steve Jobs stood up with an iPad and said, this is an iPad. And if you think about what's changed in that time, most people, when they think, they think they've had their iPads for seven, eight years because so much has changed in that time. If you'd written a digital strategy with a five-year timeline five years ago when he stood up and gave you that, how, how accurate would that be? How relevant would that be now? And the answer is it wouldn't be. I mean, that was a 
The iPad's a game changer. I mean, by the end of last year, estimates about 250 million iPads sold worldwide, invented a new category of device that now as web professionals, digital professionals, we need to address. None of that would have been relevant if you'd been writing that digital strategy with a three or a five year time um, frame in it back when he stood up in January 2010. So that kind of long term time frame stuff doesn't work for digital strategies. So that takes me to that second fail, the thing that I got wrong, which is around digital strategies about establishing the details of what we'll do. You can't write a digital strategy with heavy details across a long time frame because the world is moving so fast around you. Digital is changing in ways that I can't predict, you can't predict, no one can predict. So really, the digital strategy needs to be about being ready for change and evolving with that change. So. Digital strategy, again, it's about creating that right environment to allow your organisation to make the right decisions about digital, wherever they happen. There we go, we get there in. So, what goes into that digital strategy? A few thoughts around that. So, does anyone know who this is? No. This is Stephen Covey, who wrote a book in 1989 called Seven Habits of Effective People. I like one of the quotes from here because it's the right thing to think about when it comes to digital strategy. Begin with the end in mind. So think about what you want to achieve for your, stra your digital strategy. And the logical thing to do there is to think about what your organisation actually wants to achieve. And this is where you can tie into your organisation's long-term plan. This has got to be the place to start. The place to start isn't so-and-so thinks they need an app. This committee thinks that they should have a website about this. This, bit, this department feels, wants to do, I don't know, a digitized, process digitization. All of those are kind of tactical responses. The place to start is what is your organization seeking to achieve and build it from there. So have goals and be willing to prioritize those goals within your, your digital strategy. And that prioritization process is actually quite important because that's a place we can start to build consensus. Because one of the challenges with digital strategy is everyone has a view. Everyone has an iPad, everyone uses a laptop, everyone feels that they can use social media. They all have a view and you need to have a touch point that's agreed where you can say actually does this thing that you're proposing fit into what we actually want to do with digital. So business goals agreed and prioritized, really important starting place. Um, and I want to give you an example. So these are some goals that I think I like um, from a digital strategy point of view. This is the University of Oxford. Um, and they've got, they've got three goals. I'm not going to go through them. But you can see, if you look at this digital strategy, how it ties into the um, university's overall strategic agenda. So they've given a flavour there for what they're aiming to achieve. And it's quite broad. They've got quite broad goals there. Now, they're not as measurable as perhaps some um, strategists would like. But what they do is they provide a broad enough umbrella for people to understand what the organisation wants to do with digital, but also take that on and interpret it locally in their own teams, their own departments. And that's because we talked about digital strategy needing to enable people to do things. Um, that kind of, those kind of broader goals often work well. And the third one, those are enable knowledge exchange in digital environment. And then they're kind of just giving a little bit of extra flavour there about what they see as the goals there. So begin with the end in mind. Second thing that has to go in is an understanding of audiences. So actually knowing your members. And I know from some of the talks we've heard today so far that you have massive amounts of insight into your members, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. You've got to be thinking about how you use that in your digital strategy. So there are some tools I'll show in a minute that talk about that. The other thing that's important is forgetting that your audiences aren't just your members. So you all have teams, staff, people that work with digital day in, day out. Because digital is broad, it affects virtually everything you do, you need to think about those internal audiences as well. And that's often the person that is keying in the direct debit form. It's the person that is posting out the letters. They are really important audiences for your digital strategy as well. So don't forget them and think about it just being about external members. We use a tool called Personas. Does anyone use Personas at the moment? So... Not many. Okay, so a persona is a it's pen portrait of a fictional person that represents a particular target audience, essentially. So it's a way of bringing to life people who you're doing things for um, using digital. So we use personas in all our projects um, in the user experience phase of projects to help us build a strategic narrative around a specific thing we're trying to do. You can see here we've got some um, personas. These are actually personas we did for ourselves at Decent as part of um, improving our marketing and our strategic focus. 
And what we did was we spoke to a number of people in our target audiences, and then we've put together these fictional personas that allow us to understand the tools we're building digitally, understand how they work for different audience members. They're quite useful for bringing to life strategy with teams as well. So um, in a previous role, I used them in sort of team meetings and workshops. And you can say, does the idea that you're, you have for what you want to do this year meet Janet's needs or Helen's needs? And it's a way of having a conversation about audiences um, that's, that's grounded in reality rather than people's perception. So Persona's a good place to start for bringing your audience to life. So my third fail then. We've got, um, writing a digital strategy about websites. So this, this goes back a, quite a long time. Um, back in 2003, I worked at a bank called Egg, which was one of the world's first internet banks. And we did some digital strategy work, and we focused it just on the website. And we can, if you look back at that now, that feels like the wrong thing to do, and it inherently was the wrong thing to do, because digital isn't just about websites, not just about mobile apps. Digital is actually about realising the transformative potential for digital throughout your organisation. That could be customer facing, it could be customer services, it could be process, it could be lots of different things, it could be working styles, it could be culture, but actually if you just think about a digital strategy and think about websites and mobile apps, you're really missing the potential of digital um, to change the way you do your business. So it's my third fail. And actually what goes into digital strategy really needs to be about people, I think. So it's about ownership and governance. Um, who here has a senior officer, senior um, staff member who's responsible for digital? Who could say, this person's responsible for digital in my organisation? So a few hands, including someone who's been pointed at. That. <laughs> That's a good thing. You, digital requires that level of senior um, clout, that level of senior buy-in to be able to implement change. Because it's so broad, because it's so complex, things that you want to do require someone at the top to say, yes, this is my agenda and I'm going to drive it to make it make sense. But just having one person isn't enough. And actually, digital strategy needs to think about governance models for digital. Because you might have lots of people that want to do digital things. You might have a marketer who wants to be producing microsites. You might have a membership manager who's thinking about CRM systems and email um, send outs and things like that. You need a governance model that allows all of those people to come together and have sensible conversations about what's right for the organization, not just right for their individual bit. Uh, one of the challenges, if you don't have that, is you end up with a kind of hodgepodge of activities which don't necessarily serve your overall goals. So, the people side of it, ownership's really important and governance is really important. Second up, structures and teams. So, this, there is not a single right and wrong way to structure your di digital teams, your digital capabilities in an organisation. Depends on who you are as an organisation, depends on how big you are, depends on how challenging your agenda is, depends on lots of things. And there are lots of different models from a fully centralised digital team to fully devolved into individual specialist teams doing other things. Not to say, none of them are right or wrong, but one of them will be right or wrong for your organisation. And actually taking a conscious decision about who's going to have digital in their job descriptions, what kind of things they should be doing, how they should be working as groups, is really important to get the strategic approach to digital in your organisation. But it's also about competencies as well. So actually to do this kind of thing needs skills that may not be there in the organisation already. And that's, again, that's something that is perfectly normal and is, is what you'd expect if you're trying to introduce digital change. But there are certain things that need to be done in a certain way to make digital work well. So thinking about recruitment, thinking about staff development, involving colleagues from HR personnel is really important, again, because building the competencies for digital is crucial to actually delivering a digital strategy. So, it's also about standards and policies. And standards and policies sound really boring, don't they? They're not the most interesting thing that we all get out of bed and think, well, maybe, maybe, it's, just, maybe it's just me, but I don't get out of bed thinking I want to write another policy. But actually, they are really, really important. Particularly, the more devolved you are in your approach to digital, the more important it is to have a consistent way of doing things. So, principles are really important, actually. Think about, kind of, if you've got a strategy where some of those goals are quite loose because we can't define things down to the nth degree, some principles about the way that we want to use digital actually can be quite helpful in guiding people's thinking. So what you've got here is from the Tate. And they've got a really good digital strategy. I suggest you Google it. It's available publicly. But they are express the principles for digital that they want to bring to life through what they want to give to their audiences. So you can see that they've got increasing enjoyment, provoking thoughts, enticing to explore deeper, getting to buy things. 
So that those are the kind of principles that they could apply to a piece of digital work, whether it's an in-house ticketing system, whether it's a marketing system, whether it's a website. All the principles apply, and different teams can interpret those in different ways. So thinking about what the principles for your use of digital should be is a useful, place to, um, useful thing to be putting into your digital strategy. And they have kind of a second layer of principles, just to help, which is about the approach they've taken, which is really sort of some, some of the core values that underlie their thinking about digital. So they're audience-centred, they're insight-driven. And a lot of, when you Google across digital strategies and look at different organisations, there are some kind of consistent themes that emerge in the principles and the approach that people take. And it's worth just having a look around at some of the examples that I've got here um, to see what you could pull out that's relevant for you. So principles are really important. But also, policies to guide practice. And an example of this might be a social media policy, but it might be an accessibility policy, if you're thinking about accessibility for different audiences, legal compliance, etc. It might be about archiving, it might be about information management, it might be about data protection if you're managing um, member data. So there's lots of things that you might need. They don't all need to go into that digital strategy, but your digital strategy should set out the policies that you need to be able to govern and steer your digital effectively. Yeah. And third up, kind of getting down to the nuts and bolts of producing digital stuff, a common basis and style for digital services. So I suspect everyone in the room uses a BBC digital product, whether it's the website, whether it's a website on a mobile, whether it's an app. You will notice that there is a consistent feel, a consistent style to the way you interact, the way things look, the way content's presented. And that is the result of a very, very defined style that they have. Um, and they call it the gel. It's the global experience language. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone in the room would need to go this far, but this is what they do, and this is how they achieve that consistency of experience across every single digital thing they do. So they have, they have the kind of the nuts and bolts of typography, so what the font is, what the grid is, what the, what the branding looks like. And they also have principles. So as I talked about earlier on, they've got those underlying principles that they expect everyone that's working with BBC Digital to be complying with. So again, thinking what, you, what this means for you. Now, again, you don't need to go to this level. I would not advise you to go to this. This is an entire microsite about how to do it. But thinking about what's relevant for you. It could be a one-page style guide. It could be, it could be lots of things. But again, getting consistency in what you do is really, really important because your users will see you as one organisation rather than here's a different system from the organisation to the membership system to here's an email that looks different, here's a landing page that looks different. It's about that consistent brand experience. Um, the government does this or is doing this very well. And you think about the government came from where they had tens of different departments, all with completely different websites working in different ways. The, back just after the last election, so 2011, there was a lot of work around government digital and how digital could improve in the government, <laughs> which led to the creation of the service design manual, which again sounds really boring, but actually this is a brilliant toolkit for producing user-centered digital. And I'd suggest you look at it and pinch loads of stuff from it because it's really, really good. Um, it brings to life how to do digital practically in an organisation, whether it's big organisation or small organisation. Um, and the result of what they're doing here with the government's um, digital presence is there's an increased consistency of experience. And you'll notice that as you renew your driving licence, uh, your tax disc, and all of those kind of things we have to do digitally, or we have to do with government, you'll notice that things start to look and feel the same, the experience becomes more consistent over time. And if they can do it at the government with all the politics and all the complexity that sits with that, there's, a, there's stuff in here that we can take and use in membership organisations as well. So, those are a couple of um, standards. So, let's go back to me and getting things wrong. Um, at a different council I worked with uh, about seven years ago, I wrote a digital strategy that was about change. It wasn't just about website change, it was about changing the way people do business, it was about uh, flexible working, bring your own device, all of those kind of things. And it consisted of lots of big, chunky projects. It was, we need to spend this many hundreds of thousands, on, thousands of pounds on this kind of technology, this kind of hardware, this kind of process change. And that, looking back on it, again, was quite challenging. It wasn't really the right thing to do because, again, that level of change needs to be delivered over a number of years. And again, an organisation like that is changing rapidly as well as the digital environment changing rapidly. So setting out this digital strategy with all these big chunky projects in was a mistake. What we should have done is be thinking about being iterative and agile. So does anyone work with agile or iter iterative development at the moment? Okay, a few of you do. That's the direction that most of the 
organisations have shown you are moving towards. And the reason they're moving towards agile and iterative development is it allows them to be flexible whilst maintaining that delivery towards an end goal. So what we mean by agile and iterative is rather than I want a new website, I write a spec that's about that big and I spend the next year building it and at the end of the year I find that no one read the spec in the first place and the world's moved on and I want a different thing anyway. What we do is we work in a far more flexible way where we produce that set of requirements. It's not that big, it's that big because we keep it really tight. We don't produce umpteen different diagrams showing how to press a button. Keep it really tight. And then we deliver every two weeks. So at Decent, we do two-week sprints, they're called. So every two weeks, we, if we're doing a project, we'll release a new bit of a website. What that means is after two weeks, after four weeks, after six weeks, if someone changes their mind or the business or the client decides they have a different goal, you can just reorder the work thing, way things work, which means that you're constantly releasing new stuff rather than spending the entire year producing something that pretty much might well be out of date by the time it goes live. So that iterative and agile approach is really important. Um, so moving away from rigid and flexible projects is one of the kind of key wins you can get out of a digital strategy. Now, there's lots of stuff there, challenges for people at a senior level in organisations because senior people like to be able to sign off something Thing and then think it's actually happening, even though it may not be the right thing to be happening in the long term because the world's moving on. So there is, there's a lot of education that needs to go with delivering Agile, um, and that's something we spend quite a lot of time doing with our clients. The other thing that we are doing a lot of work nowadays with is a thing called Lean Startup. So Lean Startup pairs very nicely with Agile. Agile's about building stuff, whether it's a system, whether it's a mobile app, website, whatever. Lean Startup's about the kind of strategy that sits behind that. If we think about strategy, what we do is we think about a number of assumptions, don't we? So we think, we assume our members are going to want to do this, this, and this. We assume that at this time, they're going to want to do that. Now, the more we can ground that in insight, the better. And you have lots of data and things you can use to do that. But the only way, really, to prove whether your assumption you've made about that bit of strategy is right is by doing it. And so with agile development, what we try and do is build in lots of little micro-tests. So if you're launching, say you're launching an online application form, and you're assuming that people will be able to complete that form and you've done your user testing, the best way of actually validating whether your assumptions you've made in that are right are in doing it. Maybe you release it to a small group of your audience. Maybe you release it to a beta test audience. Maybe you do A-B testing. But if you can build it, you can measure it, see if it's working, and then learn from that, the more times you can go through that loop, the better. Because you're actually then doing things based on fact and reality, not on the assumptions that you've made or the board have made or your, um, your colleagues have made. So again, it's worth looking up Lean Startup. If you Google Lean Startup, there's some good videos that just explain the principles around it. It's a methodology that was designed for startups, so not all of it is relevant to what you guys are doing in membership organisations, but the principle of validated learning. So building something, measuring it and learning it are really, really important. And you can use that in marketing, you can use that in digital development as well. So, so whilst I've said everything's kind of broad, I think you do need some detail in there. So setting out a simple roadmap is a way to help people get a handle on what you're trying to do in the short term. Short term, I'm thinking kind of six, eight, 12 months maybe. Um, so an example here, this is um, the UN, so kind of big and big all pervasive digital across a number of different channels. And they've been quite simple about this. They have some goals. You can read them there, you'll probably get what they're trying to do just by looking at that. That's the kind of level I think that your road mapping should be at, um, rather than trying to plot out complex sequences of projects that are interlinked with each other, um, because again, that starts to build in that inflexibility that causes problems. So, set out that simple road map, and don't dodge the money question, because whilst you, if you strip out some of that detail, sometimes it's easy to kind of just gloss over the fact that this kind of thing costs money. It needs investment, it needs um, dedicated funding, maybe, maybe dedicated roles if you're looking at big projects. So don't avoid that because otherwise your digital strategy will just sit there and nothing will actually happen. So third up, getting it right, overcoming the common pitfalls. Um, this is another one of my failures that I'm slightly embarrassed about but in a way slightly proud of as well. When I first started in digital in local government, this was 2004, quite early days for digital, Local government, very traditional, very undigital place. And what I found was that actually it was easier to get stuff done just by doing it and not asking. Um, and then people were quite pleased with the results generally. And occasionally you'd, let, you'd get away with a few problems, a few mistakes, because you didn't ask for permission. 
And I thought, actually, I can make this work. But what I learned over a period of years was actually you can go so far with that. You can do kind of low-level improvements, and no one's really going to be that bothered. But if you want to achieve lasting strategic change with digital, so you want to transform an organisation through digital, you can't do that by just doing pockets of guerrilla activity kind of here and there. You've got to have that overarching approach, that thing that the people at the top the people who hold the purse strings, buy into the thing that they actually want that ties into the organisation's goals. So Gorilla's good and it's fun and it's great. You can do lots of little things. But actually, if you want to deliver real lasting change, you've got to have an overarching approach, I think. You've got to have strong leadership. So there's a few people in the room who are responsible for this kind of thing. But you need, every, you need to be educating and engaging your senior team in digital. Whilst you need someone who's going to drive it, everyone else needs to understand it at least. They may understand it to different degrees, but they've got to have an understanding about what you're trying to do what the hurdles might be, what the benefits might be with digital. And so that senior team champion is really important. Also think about wider governance models and think about stakeholders too. There will be people you need to involve. They might be IT people, they might be external agencies you're working with, they might be suppliers, they might be all sorts of people. Make sure you've thought about them and how you're going to deliver this thing. Um, so yeah, just data that backs up. The, um, this is a McKinsey study about the factors that contribute or, uh, to success and failure in digital strategy. And the top three, you see two of them. One of them is about senior management's interest or desire um, to change practices. So are they really up for it? So that's one of the things that makes a real difference. And that internal leadership comes across really strongly. So you can't do enough, really, with the senior team and hearts and minds when it comes to delivering digital change. OK. And uh, three fails to go, I think. We're almost there. Um, digital strategy can have end dates. So when I wrote local government digital strategy, it was a three-year plan. It looks very nice. I don't know why we always pick three years, but we think it looks nice, and we can make nice charts that go across three years, and they just fit on A4 page, all the rest of it. just doesn't work. Actually, digital strategy never, it's digital is never finished, is it? Website's never finished. The world is moving on. The speed of change is really important. The, the speed of change within your organisation is what you'll doubtless be experiencing increasing speed of change, pressure on cost, all the rest of it. So really, if you think about digital strategies, that thing that sits above it, it doesn't have an end date. The things you do within it might change, but often those principles, those things that sit behind digital, will last for a number of years because they are enabling you to change, enabling your organisation to change. But it's also important to manage expectations. So don't let people run away with the idea that it's going to change the world overnight, it's going to deliver massive cost savings, it's going to do all these things. Be realistic about them, about costs and benefits, and educate the right people, whether that's senior people, team managers, budget holders, whoever it is in your organisation. But don't be afraid to shout about successes as well. So when you get the successes, particularly early in a change programme driven by digital, it's worth shouting about them because it starts to build confidence in, um, in the digital change programme. I'm a fail seven. We know best and can make the right decisions on digital strategy. So we are the digital experts. We're the digital team. We're the marketing team. Whoever we are, and we think we know best about digital. It's not true. Actually, you've got to base your decisions in evidence and data wherever you can. You all have lots of data. You've got to make the most of that to back up your decisions. And that will actually help you in that educating and informing bit as well, because it won't come across as your views. It will come across as evidence-based practice. And if you look at those um, principles I showed you earlier on, evidence-based is in virtually all of them. And that's what Build, Measure, Learn helps you with as well. So how do you avoid that bias and that habitual thinking that comes with um, dealing with this kind of thing day out? I'd say start by understanding your data sources. I guarantee you'll have more information, more insight, more, sorry, more data than you realise when you look across your organisations and think about who holds that data. So once you've worked out what the data is, starting to think how you can move from data to insight, and particularly insight that helps you with digital strategy and the projects that might sit within that. And use external challenge carefully. So you can do this yourselves. I'm not saying you need to work with an agency to do it. I'm not saying you need to work with consultants to do it. But think about how external challenge might just help you challenge some of the assumptions you make because your thinking may be constrained by the way that things have been done in the past, the way that you've seen things done elsewhere. Use it carefully and wisely. So my final fail is actually about digital change is about delivering digital. And that's it's just not the case because... I don't know where he's gone. Change is really about people and culture, and the scale of change, the transformative nature of digital change in the organisations isn't about whether you have a system that does this or a system that does that or whether your customers can do this online. It's really about people and it's about culture. That's what change comes to when we talk about digital strategy. The digital will enable it for you. It will allow you to do things that were never possible before, but it won't succeed unless you take people with you. And people in the organisation, people outside the organisation, and it won't 
happen unless you've got the culture that allows it to happen. Um, and this, this is a MIT study that talks about the things that stop digital transformation happening. If you look at the top ones, competing priorities. So it's not high enough any, up anyone's agenda. Again, it's a cultural thing about what they choose to do with it. Lack of familiarity, that's about competence and skills in the organization. And then resistance, this is the way we've always, how many times have you heard this is the way we've always done it or that's the way we do it here? That's about resistance. And again, has, you can break that down lots of different ways, but those are the kind of things. And those aren't digital. Technology is easy compared to those. People are the difficult thing in delivering this kind of change. So if I leave you with one thing, digital strategy is important, but cultural change is even more important. This online resource was brought to you today by the MemberWise Network, the leading free-to-join best practice network for membership and association professionals. Find out how we can provide you with more practical help and support at www.memberwise.org.uk.